Thank you. Thanks, Walker, for having me. Um, I run a uh, management consultancy, a boutique management consultancy called Calculation Consulting. And we specialize in data science leadership. We provide uh, consulting and technical solutions for a variety of companies trying to uh, use data science and machine learning, artificial intelligence algorithms to generate revenue um, in, a, in a wide variety of uh, industries. If you, we'll have a question and answer ses session later, but if we get cut short, you feel free to uh, um, just email me at charles at calculationconsulting.com. There we go. Um, as, as Volker said, I have a background in, in theoretical physics and chemical physics and uh, worked for I've been doing machine learning for well over 10 years. Um, most notably, I worked with Demand Media, which was the first billion dollar IPO since Google. And the first part of the talk, I'm just going to kind of talk about them as a case study of what we did with Demand Media, how we got them to be the first billion dollar IPO, and what Google did, and what the response was, and the broader impact it had on the market. Um, I've also bring a lot of experience working with various lean startups like Aardvark, um, BlackRock, Fortune 500 companies, things like this. So let's move on this way. OK. Uh, does anybody ever use eHow? You know eHow.com? Yeah. Okay. So what do you think would be like the most common query on the internet that people type in? Well, like the most popular for an eHow. Any idea? How to make cookies. Uh, close. How to get rid of flabby arms. <laughs> How to get rid of flabby arms is your number one uh, query. At least it was for a long period of time. And uh, so what we were doing at Demand Media is we developed uh, an approach which allowed us to predict what people were going to search for on Google. It, it turns out that probably between 60 and 80% of all searchers are repeat searches. And by knowing what you were going to search for on Google, well, we could front run it and create content for it. So what, was what Demand Media was doing is that we had thousands and thousands of freelance writers. And at one point, we were probably generating over 100,000 pieces of content per month and publishing it on the internet and getting listed in Google. And at one point, I think we may have had a, top, a first page result in 70% of all of Google's queries for the non-adult queries. And, and I think there, hypocritically, we thought we might have been generating up to one third of all of uh, Google's AdSense revenue. So this was a very successful, sustainable business. And by applying machine learning algorithms, it was the, the, sort of the story is that Demand Media wanted to go IPO. Uh, and to go IPO, they needed to have a model which would allow them to predict revenue. And at the time, I was working as a quant at BlackRock, in the, which is a, um, a Wall Street firm that we were predicting the stock market uh, using machine learning algorithms. And they wanted us to develop a machine learning algorithm that would allow them to predict revenue so that they could count their web pages as assets as opposed to expenses. And we, I was able to produce an algorithm for them to do this. It's a very famous pat, uh, patent, the Demand Media patent. They have an article in Wired Magazine called The Answer Factory where they discuss this. But I was brought in. We developed this patent, this algorithm. We were the first billion dollar IPO since Google. So what happened to them? You know, where, where are they now? EHO is still a very big property. But let's take a look at what happened. What did Google do when we did this? So in 2011, we went IPO. We were the first billion dollar IPO. We went up to about $40 a share. Then Google, among other things, changed CEOs. And Eric Schmidt stopped, stepped down, and Larry Page took over during this time, during some time in here. And then a series of al algorithm changes were implemented called Panda and Penguin. And the implementation of the Panda algorithm at first didn't really affect us, and then the stock tanked immediately and just tanked and tanked and tanked and went all the way down to maybe six bucks a share, somewhere between six and 10. It's pretty much stayed there and hasn't come back up. So this is huge. I mean, this is a billion dollar company. And within a matter of months, just saw its, its uh, investor confidence just disappear. So what were the reasons for the confidence to disappear? Well, some people felt they had a lack of diversification. They're only relying on Google for traffic. We had these great algorithms, but they only applied to one source. Some people, is a great argument internally about adaptation. What do you do? Should we try to fix demand media's properties and adapt to Panda using new algorithms? 
or should we try to diversify and move into new markets? So you can imagine what it's, I don't know if you can imagine what it's like being in an IPO in the middle of something like this and there's a huge amount of conflict and confusion in the leadership organization about what to do and how to rebuild investor confidence. But long and the short of it is, you know, they, um, stock price still hasn't recovered, they're still trying. So the, the story is to try to get it a, a, across this idea when you're talking about leadership, we're talking about governance, and we're talking about accountability. What happened? What, why, did, why did this happen? What was the, the broader impact? Was this predictable? I mean, did they, could, you, could you foresee that this was going to happen, and were you prepared for it? Well, one of the arguments that I've made, and I, and I think an argument can be made, is that because we cornered the market on search, we induced a market crash. Uh, I, I think some of the analysis said that over a billion dollars in ad revenue was essentially repriced and reallocated throughout the entire AdSense market. So this just didn't affect eHow and Demand Media. Look at WebMD. WebMD is a billion dollar company. And they don't produce spam. You know, it's not like we're getting rid of flabby arms. They produce content for people who are asking questions, uh, legitimate medical inquiries. That's a, a major operation. They've been around for probably 10 years. And they just, they're, they just basically tanked. You know, you can see the same thing. Uh, CPC revenues are down, and a large number of online publishers, online properties basically started to vanish. So this was a, an effect of Panda. And, and wide scale across, there was a huge wide scale effect across the entire industry. A, a direct result of basically Google um, redoing their algorithms. I would also say, however, uh, so I'll give you an example, this is one of the examples I give with, with uh, kind of make the argument, if you look at WebMD, the traffic went up. How did they respond to this? The response was, well, you know, did we walk away from it? They're not going to walk away from it. Well, let's try to buy, con let's try to buy traffic. You should, if you buy traffic, you can run ads, you can buy traffic. You know, tr organic traffic will go up. This is their Alexa rank from 2011 through 2012. Well, that's great. Traffic went up. Uh, this is about where Panda hit. And this is where Panda hit. Margins, you know, revenues were flat, even with traffic up. Traffic is up, revenues are flat, margins are in the gutter. They died. And they, just, they just took a, a sharp nosedive. And this was very common across the industry. Moreover, you look at Google, which I think is a more interesting piece of the puzzle. If you, if you use Google now and you search for something like how to get rid of flabby arms, what do you get? You used to get an article, how to get rid of flabby arms. Now you get things like how to get rid of flabby arms in 20 days. How to get rid of flabby arms doing CrossFit. How to get rid of flabby arms eating only Greek yogurt. If you've noticed this, Google essentially broke their search. They changed it, they randomized it. They don't want people to know how to get on the front page. If you know how to get on the front page of Google, you don't have to pay them any money. They don't make any money, their CPC goes down. Well, by changing their search algorithm, I would say that they decreased the quality of their search results. And this, after Panda, for the first time uh, ever in the history of Google, their CPC rates dropped. Uh, uh, the next quarter and stayed down for most of the next year and a half. Now if you read their SEC filings, they're going to say to you, well, no, it's mobile, it's Facebook, it's social, we're being cannibalized. But, and you know, nobody, if you read an SEC song, no one ever, no one ever breaks out the numbers and shows you exactly what's going on. But if you, if you, you know, if you think a correlation is a, causa is a causation, you, you definitely can see that something significant happened. So, with this happening, you know, I, I was a quant at Wall Street. I was a Wall Street quant, and we had gone through many of these kinds of crashes in the Wall Street in the markets. You know, we Wall Street's been applying mathematical algorithms for you know well over 15 years. A lot of the guys I mean, we went to school with in Chicago went off and became quants and are running the desks at Citadel and uh, Goldman Sachs. And there were a number of crashes that occurred as a direct result of, math, of these applying algorithmic techniques. One is Black Monday. Uh, it used to be that there were hundreds of traders in the Pacific Exchange. There's a, the play, I think it's an Equinox gym now uh, across the street. But it was, a, it was an options exchange run by John Brown. And, and, um, there were guys who were trading options. They would buy low and they would sell high. This is how they would trade. This was their business. And one day, one Monday in 1987, the options markets basically repriced. And 
what they thought were these implied volatilities, these values they get from their mathematical models, Black-Scholes model, just changed. The, what they say now is that uh, Black-Scholes is wrong in the wings. There's a smile to it. But the, essentially what happened was there was a model that was released. It was Black-Scholes model. A couple of Nobel, the University of Chicago guys. Nobel Prize was won. People started trading it. The market sort of got to a point where it was um, overtraded, and it just collapsed. The entire market collapsed. Uh, another good example we know from Wall Street was long-term capital management, which was a very large hedge fund, also with a couple of Nobel Prizes, either on staff or on retainer. And they were trying to exploit fixed, in, uh, fixed income arbitrage. And same thing. You know, they got to a certain point. They started exploiting these models, and it collapsed. Um, I think we all remember the housing crisis of 2008, where the markets collapsed. What, what you might not realize that, that this was started by using something called a Gaussian couple model, which was developed at BlackRock. So it's very frequently that you, you develop some mathematical algorithm, you put it into a market, you start applying it, you start leveraging it, and the market just changes on you rapidly. And I, I think it's kind of naive uh, to not expect this. And you have to ask yourself from a leadership perspective or a governance perspective, when you start doing this, you know, you, you're going to have some real issues involved uh, if you don't understand what your algorithms are doing if you don't understand how to adapt if there's a problem, if you don't understand what the impact will be on the overall market. So this is sort of the, the case study of sort of what happened during their, um, uh, with demand media. So I kind of want to talk more in general terms, sort of when we do uh, work with engagements with companies, the kind of thing.